Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Robert Cardillo, and I'm happy to be your host here today for a research roundtable predicting and responding to outbreaks. This roundtable is sponsored by the St. Louis University Research Institute and GeoSLU. And I'm very pleased to be part of such a distinguished uh, group to have such an important discussion. Um, in case uh, we haven't met, I have the privilege of being the sixth director of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency until last year. And for the past year have been uh, equally privileged to be a distinguished geospatial fellow at St. Louis University. In that capacity, it's been rewarding to uh, learn more and more about the enriched and expert community uh, that exists in and around the St. Louis region. And as the world deals with uh, the, the initial crisis around the medical and health condition and the, and, the, and the subsequent issues with respect to the economic drawdown and slowdown and shutdown, uh, I believe strongly that this uh, is a new demand signal uh, for the expertise that uh, St. Louis and the region uh, certainly has had and has going forward. So, um, as I said, I think this pandemic, it's been clear, has exposed us to systemic weaknesses uh, and it's necessitated innovative strengths. And to me, it's those strengths that we'd like to talk about here today that will help us get one, get to the other side of the crisis and then position our society to predict, predict the next threat as well as to mitigate its effects on our citizens and our economy. And to do all of that, I can't think of a better panel than we have uh, today to have this conversation. And, and we need you as well to be part of the conversation. You'll see a question tab at the bottom of your screen and please do feel free to enter questions and or comments uh, there at any time. The rough plan is I'll talk to the panel for about half an hour, uh, introducing them and opening questions, and then we'll turn to you and have a broader discussion. But that brings me uh, to our first panelist. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Alex Garza. Alex is the head of the St. Louis Metropolitan Pandemic Task Force and the Chief Medical Officer with SSM. Alex, welcome. Thanks very much for joining us here today. And I'd ask if you start, could start by giving us a quick progress report on how the response is going from your perspective. Yeah, thanks, Robert. And good afternoon, everybody. So um, I'll just give a really broad overview on how uh, COVID-19 is, is affecting the St. Louis metropolitan area. So as most people that live in St. Louis um, know, we, we had a, a spike in cases uh, fairly early on in the spring, or actually it was late spring. Uh, around the March, April timeframe. We, we peaked in, in late April, but have been in a steadily, steady decline uh, since that time period, both in, in the number of hospitalizations that we've seen and new admissions, um, a lot of other parameters. We have seen the case counts sort of fluctuate, but uh, some of that is attributable to testing uh, uh, paradigms, more testing coming on board, things like that. But when you look at one of the primary outcomes, which is how much stress is it putting on the healthcare system, we have seen a, a really steady decline. And that correlates, as, as, as you know, with uh, the shelter in place orders and all of the other uh, uh, things that we've put in place in order to protect people, to protect the public. So right now where we are, uh, we've, we've reduced our admissions rate into, to down around a, about a 15 uh, uh, or seven day moving average, which is what we use, is around 15. So 15 new admissions a day. Our hospitalizations have, have come down uh, nicely as well. Uh, so much so that the healthcare sector has begun to uh, go back and, and reopen to other, um, other healthcare deliveries, such as elective surgeries, things like that. Um, you know, uh, we've, we've been preaching all of those public health measures, wearing masks, social distancing, all of those things while we've been uh, reopening the economy. And I think people have been very adherent to that advice and it's, uh, and it's uh, paid off. Now, certainly um, it uh, affects different uh, parts of the community differently. We know from looking at the data uh, that um, age, uh, uh, comorbid disease, um, and race uh, all play all play a role in who gets affected by COVID, um, and and because of that, we've seen predominantly the African American community has been 
has been hit much harder than other communities. And so I don't want to lose that in the conversation as well, um, that there are socio and economic factors that play into this. Overall, though, still doing well, Robert, and, and hopefully we can continue on that path. Hey, thanks, Alex, uh, for that um, overview, but also thanks for everything you're doing. Um, truly, you're at the center of the, of the response uh, in the region, and uh, really appreciate that. Um, next, I'd like to turn to a colleague and friend, Dr. Enbal Shakam. Enbal is the Professor of Public Health and the Associate Director of GeoSLU at St. Louis University. Welcome, Enbal, to the broadcast. And why don't you uh, start by talking a little bit about what SLU, St. Louis University, and the Geospatial Institute has done to help address the COVID-19 pandemic in St. Louis and the region. Great, thank you for having me today. I, um, you know, in the work that St. Louis University has been doing, it's a lot, it's probably similar to lots of other universities, but we're really focused on thinking about from the virus to the satellite, really, um, because we're uniquely positioned to thinking about with colleagues at the School of Medicine as they're working to develop tests and treatment options and vaccine and test those in our community members and um, we at the health lab at the Geospatial Institute are working on many different projects um, and some of them are um, collaborative with the, the School of Medicine effort as well. Um, but generally we're looking how to best identify predictors around COVID as they're, it's anchored in location. Um, as, as Alex highlighted, the diversity and impact in the vulnerable populations that we uh, experience in the St. Louis region, but also in throughout the world, we're seeing who is more affected. Um, and, and now what we're trying to do is identify why. We started by looking at mapping at areas with, uh, that are at particularly high risk because of their chronic diseases and the rates of chronic diseases. And then we were able to look at um, develop, really developing an app to monitor symptoms to, for employers and employees is what we originally were trying to do, rolling it out for um, people who were putting themselves at, at, at risk and monitor them symptoms uh, daily. And so when we were able to develop and roll out this app, we're really identifying an opportunity also to using technology to contact trace for people who find out that they were exposed or, or for people who are um, able to see that they were exposed to somebody um, for whom is now positive for COVID. So we're, able, we're trying to complement the contact tracing, tracing efforts that are currently happening with our public health agencies. We're do, doing this on our campus as well as employees and students come back to campus. Further, we've been analyzing community mobility data throughout the region and the state. And so that I really looks at using anonymized smartphone data and identifying what are the patterns of movement for our community residents. So we were able to use and see, use those data and complement them with COVID rates and seeing, okay, stay while we were under the stay at home in place, uh, orders, what, we, what were we seeing? Who was leaving their home and for why? What were the reasons they were leaving their home? So we were able to see the difference in rural and more urban communities, even the suburban and urban communities were more similar than the rural areas. People were traveling farther in rural communities for um, work. And we recognize that that's uh, usual, right? So ultimately pe people in urban communities travel less distances and yet rural communities are traveling farther distances. And that wasn't such a concern um, when the COVID rates weren't really impacted in our rural communities at, at that time. Now it's shifting and so we're looking at the patterns differently now. The other thing that we found with those patterns was really looking at how, why were people leaving their homes in certain areas in the St. Louis region and they were leaving for full-time work. And so we identified what types of patterns of um, employment, they included things like healthcare support services and um, food services. And so thinking about those pieces and transportation. And so thinking about how are those really our essential employees in this, in the time of COVID. They're not what um, employment looked like as essential employment previously. COVID has in introduced this essential term for people who are working in grocery stores or working at um, 
support staff for nursing homes and that sort of thing. And so thinking about who is putting themselves at risk, we haven't really fully, I think the next step is to see how does employment serve as a risk factor in this, in this um, pandemic where previously it was a predictor of better health outcomes because empl being employed is better than not being employed. So that's a broad range of all the things we're doing, but it's, it's just uh, actually just this, the tip of the iceberg is what we've been working on. Thanks, Ann Ball. Um, Thank well, it's not surprising. It's always good to hear that St. Louis University is continuing its 200 plus years of service-based uh, mission work. And so thanks for, to you and the team for that. Um, our third panelist here today, uh, another colleague and friend, uh, is Jason Hall. Uh, Jason is the co-founder and CEO of Arch to Park and very active uh, in our community, bridging uh, conversations from industry leaders to civic uh, leadership, et cetera. So Jason, I know you've been in the midst of the debates and the discussions and the hard decisions that have to be made on reopening strategies and how and when to do so. Sometimes these uh, decisions get framed as uh, economic necessity or benefits and, and, and health. Um, do you see it as a one or the other, or how do you see weighing uh, both of those? Jason, welcome, welcome to our panel. I appreciate it, Robert, and it's uh, great to be here, and thank you uh, for the opportunity to participate on the panel. Um, you know, I, I think it is important to recognize um, you know, the pandemic itself was an unprecedented uh, threat to public health uh, and the economy. Uh, it's a virus and uh, it, it has to be controlled. Um, and this was thrust upon us um, as a pandemic. And, and I would go back, you know, less one or the other. I, I thought uh, um, that Jim Bullard, the president and CEO of the St. Louis Fed, who had spoken about this nationally said, you know, we really had to make an investment in public health. And that was brought about by a controlled, partial, and temporary um, shutdown of certain sectors uh, of the U.S. economy. Um, but that fundamentally, the productive capacity of the economy was strong, but it was a decision we had to make uh, to control uh, the spread of the transmission of the virus and ultimately uh, save lives. Um, so I, I think of it less as either or, but it's really a framing that it was an investment and an intentional choice around public health. And I do want to mention in that context and really applaud uh, the leadership of Dr. Alex Garza, our elected officials uh, in the region and their public health directors uh, working in partnership with our healthcare systems, because the St. Louis metropolitan region issued those stay at home orders um, prior to most governors in this country. St. Louis was really on the cutting edge of the right public policy. And those are tough choices. They're easy to say, but when you're an elected official, uh, those are very tough. And now as we um, enter the uh, reopening uh, of the US economy, our understanding of the virus, our understanding of transmission and the underlying science and um, risk factors is getting better. And so I think we are finding um, and deploying policy that really demonstrates it's not public health or economy, it's really both in balance and that we have to adapt um, for the economy to operate in the context of a pandemic because we can't fool ourselves. The virus has not gone away. It is still a threat. Second wave issues are still a threat, but we know some of the basics social distancing six feet apart, washing our hands, the face masks, those basics go a long way in allowing us to reopen the economy and have, a, have an economy while still deploying really good sound public health uh, policy. So they are, they are tension points and we're learning how to, how to uh, keep those two um, in balance. And I think we know that if we can control those second wave issues through the good preventative measures that the pandemic task force um, on a separate part of that work led by Dr. Stephen Lawrence um, helped work in partnership with the business community to find reopening guidance and guidelines that we could deploy throughout the community uh, in a structured way uh, so that we could reopen while keeping uh, the transmission low. Um, 
I, I would point out, I think also, just as we, we can talk about this uh, in broad strokes as I, as I just did, but I would be remiss you know, in this environment uh, to also recognize, as, as Alex did, the impacts uh, that came about from uh, the partial close down of the economy and the way in which we were reopening were not spread evenly. And they impacted uh, small businesses and Main Street businesses in, often in a much more significant way. And we need to be mindful of that as we put in place economic policy uh, to support them in reopening. Uh, secondly, but, but equally as importantly, you know, the literature and analysis that's coming out is it affected black owned businesses in a more significant way. So we know that that's the result of structural racism and, and other issues that, that we need to confront as a society, but it also reminds us as we put in place policy to support those businesses in reopening, we need to be mindful that those impacts were not spread evenly and policy equally needs to be uh, tailored to those specific needs and impacts. Hey, thanks, Jason. Uh, again, thanks for all that you're doing to help work through the crisis and, and obviously for that very important reminder uh, at the end that uh, uh, the virus impacts have been uh, unequal, uh, unfortunately, in, in a pattern that's got some history to it. And speaking of, of history, uh, I'm very pleased to welcome to our panel, Dr. Chris Tinson. Chris is the Director of African American Studies and an Associate Professor of History at St. Louis University. And Chris, I know just given your academic standing, but, uh, but also your community work that you've spent extensive time with the local community. And I think picking up on, on Jason's uh, close there, uh, help us to understand how the pandemic has affected uh, local communities, uh, uh, perhaps in ways that, that, that people may not appreciate. Uh, thanks, Chris. Yeah, well, I'm glad to be here. This is such a, a learning opportunity for me, and I think that that's part of what this moment offers for, for all of us, quite frankly. Um, as a starting point, um, of course, we want to give a special shout out to Dr. Garza and the work that he's doing, especially since he's a SLU alum. We got to give you some props on that. Um, but I'd like to start with uh, Professor Will Ross from Wash U, who, who wrote an op-ed that, that gives us some context for uh, some of the things that we're talking about. SARS-CoV-2, known as the novel coronavirus, is 2.5 times more infectious than the flu and 10 to 20 times more fatal and thus more likely to overwhelm susceptible populations. We define susceptible populations as those who are unable to reach their full health potential because of social and structural barriers to health, including poverty, joblessness, inadequate housing, food insecurity, lack of access to affordable health care, and inadequate education. And so I like to just start there so that can frame some of the things I want to talk about here. Um, in terms of some of the work that I've been inspired by that's been going on in our local community. In terms of food distribution and supply distribution networks, um, I want to salute Mission St. Louis for the work that they've been doing uh, with self-help and self-preservation work in our local community. In terms of deepening our social analysis and picking up on Dr. Ross's description of COVID is Action St. Louis, Prepare STL, and of course, uh, the Forward Through Ferguson uh, commission. Uh, and so I think that those are some of the groups and organizations that have been doing wonderful work, continuous work really, uh, for the last five years, and many have just responded to the moment that we're in now. But with special attention to what Action St. Louis and Prepare STO and others have identified, the question is how are these communities, uh, communities of color, black communities, how are they overexposed to certain health risks? And what are these health risks? Asthma, food insecurity, or some would call it food apartheid, lead poisoning, vacant properties, mold exposure, air pollution, home energy costs, and of course, racism, structural racism. In addition to that, I mean, people have to, ne to negotiate and navigate this newfound reality that we have to homeschool our children. Uh, many, of, many of us who who have children at home have been faced with this. And it unfortunately 
has a disproportionate impact on people whose earning income comes from uh, nine to five jobs or being out of the home. And so this has been a very difficult thing that people have had to navigate. And there hasn't been one uh, rule of thumb or one set practice that applies to all families equally. Um, so people have been homeschooling. People have been learning how to do that. People have been spending time learning themselves. People have been coming together, writing, thinking, studying, supporting each other, forming coalitions, critical study groups, and of course, protecting themselves and their families to the best of their abilities. And again, this is much like the collective work that we saw in and around the Ferguson uprising. Um, those energies, of course, are still here, even if they aren't always sustained, and I believe that they are reawakened now. But I think more critically, there's a question of how we understand resource depletion and extraction in a both historic and chronic sense. So the fact that these things are rooted in history, but also persist in our present, and the way in which they impact local community, one area that we've uh, found some intersection is around the Close the Workhouse campaign, where people have been identifying the potential for uh, spreading of uh, COVID in carceral institutions around the country and also those within our local community. Um, so some scholars have begun to call these, these impacts uh, collectively and the way we map things, since, since we're thinking about mapping, is to think about them as geographies of exclusion and the, the violent and disruptive policies that have led to these geographies and marked these geographies of exclusion is something that we have to disrupt. And the other piece is we have to counter the normalization of despair, right? Which describes the ways in which more secure communities and individuals view black suffering as normalized, whose identities are secured by the segregation of adequate resources in St. Louis, and who benefits, for example, from a historic conundrum called the Del Mar Divide. Uh, we know that this is not new by any stretch of the imagination, uh, but because it's not new, we have to call it chronic. We have to call them reproduced. And it's that kind of security that reproduces and enacts, reenacts the insecurity that leaves particularly vulnerable populations perpetually exposed to social crisis. So I thought we'd begin, at least my comments and what I have to contribute, thinking about some of those questions. Thank you. Um, Chris, that's, a, that's an essential frame uh, for this conversation. So thank you for that. Thanks for the work that you do to better understand those conditions, but more importantly, uh, frame them so that uh, we can, we can uh, address uh, the gaps and disparities as you described. Uh, rounding out our panel, uh, very pleased to have Jared Schultz. Jared is uh, from Esri, um, and he is the Health and Human Services Technical Lead. And uh, Jared, it's great to have you here today, uh, and why not, you start by helping us understand what is Esri's role um, in supporting government, academic, healthcare research uh, that we've uh, touched on today in the panel introduction, and uh, any changes that you've already seen in your technology as, as we've uh, experienced this pandem pan pandemic. Welcome, Jared. Thanks a lot, Robert, and um, I really appreciate the opportunity to get to speak on such a distinguished panel here. While I'm not from um, the St. Louis area, Esri has strong ties with that area, um, you know, direct linkages with the National Geospatial Intelligence Administration, as well as the university. Um, Esri is the largest GIS software and services company in the world. Um, we've got a global reach, um, and we have been really highly engaged during this entire um, pandemic. Um, you know, e even prior to this, I mean, we, we are working with um, individuals at the county, state, federal level. Um, you know, we're, we're working with international organizations, um, uh, trade, associ uh, trade associations, different countries. Um, you know, here are a few of the groups that we've been working with lately, um, quite a few different um, projects with the White House, a very interesting one that's coming through the CDC to help every jurisdiction of the U.S., um, you know, get standardized dashboards and data made available, you know, Census Bureau standing up their COVID-related hub, working with FEMA um, on a lot of their tools, which include, um, you know, their hub portals and ASPR with their GeoHealth portal, uh, we partnered up with the World Health Organization um, to provide our technology and tools to every country in the world and the World Bank to help kind of sort out, you know, what areas um, are at greatest need of um, funding 
Um, and, and there's just a few other groups here. I mean, you know, with St. Louis University, it's part of Esri's um, overall kind of strategy to create, you know, site licenses of software for all the major universities around the, um, the world so that, you know, individuals can have direct access to the software and tools they're going to need to address, you know, some of these really complicated issues like geographies of, you know, exclusion and, and you know, making these decisions on how to balance health and economic needs. Um, so, so we've really got a, a wide reach here, um, you know, both in the public and private sector, and it's, it's really positioned us to help during this pandemic. Um, you know, health GIS professionals, and I've been doing this for uh, over 20 years now, um, as the deputy director and director of the State Department of Health in South Carolina, as, as well as, you know, in some university settings. And, um, you know, every health issue is complicated, and this current pandemic is no different. You know, health departments alone cannot solve these problems. They need to be working in tandem with emergency management, economic development. The, the county agencies need to work with the state agencies, with the federal agencies. We've seen a lot of this work related to capturing information on, um, you know, bed capacity, I, ICUs, ventilators, PPE, and all sorts of different things. So, um, you know, we have been well situated to have that geographic tool in place in so many organizations that provides a common framework or a language um, that all these different organizations um, speak to. Um, you know, we, we've done a lot. One of the main things that I had worked on, um, it was um, our COVID-19 GIS hub. Um, I saw some questions come through already from our, um, you know, our attendees on data. And, and, you know, data has been the currency um, of this pandemic. You know, we've been working with organizations around the clock to make new data sets available, whether it's been social mobility data from Blue Dot or Unicast or SafeGraph or, or Facebook for Good, or whether it's modeling data around the IHME tools, the Chime tools, the Columbia, MIT, um, you know, any of these different groups here. Um, the particular COVID hub that you're seeing here um, has gotten well over 2 million hits and it's come like become like a virtual gathering place um, for people that are responding to this issue. Um, it's gotten well over 2 million hits um, and it's where people to go to engage with our disaster response program. You know, typically we answer, you know, upwards of a thousand disaster response program requests a year um, that are for hurricanes and flooding and different types of disasters. We offer free software and services. We're upwards of 4,500 right now. Um, for organizations all over the world. You know, we have been stockpiling applications. You know, um, we've got a couple of apps linked on the, the hub that show over 300 applications registered from around the world from different countries um, that have stood up dashboards and open data portals and services for people to use. In, in the US, we've got about 400 now, and these are just the ones we registered. There's so many more. Um, you know, you can see, you know, in the right hand um, side of the slide there, the Johns Hopkins dashboard. It's kind of become the face of this pandemic. It's been hit over a trillion times, um, you know, since it's been put up. I mean, the, the amount of traffic to there has been phenomenal. Um, you know, and we've also um, stood up a set of solution templates. We've seen distinct patterns emerging. Um, you know, people want to have dashboards, cases, deaths, hospitalizations, localized outbreaks, and they want to have them break down by race and ethnicity. They want to see epi curves and trends. They want to see all this information. Um, well, we've templatized those things. We have something called ArcGIS Solutions. These are for business recovery, for businesses to be able to have their employees check in and attest, to check in with their home, do wellness checks, to do locators, to find testing facilities. You know, even to organize and determine how you're going to put your testing facilities, not just based on where people are at, but where people um, that uh, have harder times getting to these testing facilities are at so that we can locate these in an equitable way and make sure that we get as many people to them as possible. Um, and, and these patterns have really taken hold and, and we're seeing that not only apps data being crucial to this response, you know, South Carolina, for example, stood up a dashboard that got 18 million hits, but yet its underlying data sets had over 226 million hits. So people are getting this data and wiring it into all sorts of different aspects of their operations. And kind of the last thing here that I wanted to um, briefly touch on is the, this kind of workflow that we've been seeing where individuals and communities and organizations have been going in and 
understanding community risk, looking at, at, at surge, doing modeling, um, understanding economic impacts, um, and then implementing policies and using things like what um, Enbal mentioned to look at social distancing and see well how, how well people are adhering you know, to different types of um, rules and regulations and advice that's been put out there. You know, taking this information, allocating resources effectively and efficiently, not just based on population, but all these different factors, and then communicating this information. This is key. You know, I've been in government for a long time before coming to Esri, and everybody wants to understand why decisions are being made in certain locations and what feeds into them. And you know, now we're seeing a lot of um, um, interest around contact tracing, and we've kind of upped that discussion to community contact tracing to be able to identify areas in the community where you're having transmission that may not necessarily be from person to person that can kind of help organizations, you know, get a handle on some of these things. Um, and then the last thing here is just uh, around a lot of what our other panelists have been discussing, which is around, you know, health equity and economic impacts. Um, you know, we've curated a bunch of data sets and made them available. A lot of um, our partners that normally um, charge for their data have made it available for free now for people to wire into these models to factor in how social distancing is flattening the curve and what would happen if they didn't, what are the economic impacts and, you know, what people are going to what businesses. And, you know, we, we just, Esri's role as we see it is to make, you know, best practices easier to implement, make data available and really, you know, um, you know, provide the data to for people to make better decisions based on facts. Hey, thanks very much, uh, Jared. That's a great um, overview of a, a wonderful company with great capabilities uh, that are clearly enabling the kind of work that the panel was talking about. So uh, now we're into the uh, the free for all uh, team. So everyone be on the edge of their seat. Um, but uh, Alex, I'm going to come back to you first for two reasons. One, we got a question in the Q and A room that I'd like to ask you. But uh, as I get to that one, I, I know we'll have plenty of time later someday to do a big lessons learned and a big study about you know what worked and what didn't. But could you say at this point, you know, um, uh, do you have you have could is there one thing that you would have wished we would have either done differently or you know approached differently for wave one? And the question that I'm going to tease out of the the room from the audience is about wave two, you know, is there anything that perhaps we could learn already and then apply so that wave two could perhaps be reduced? Yeah, that's a good question, Robert. And I don't know if I have a great answer for you for the, for wave one. And it's not that we did everything perfect because certainly, you know, there's, there's always things that you can improve upon. So um, let me talk about some of the things that I think went well though. And so some of those were um, when Jason had mentioned the elected officials making decisions early on to do shelter in place, uh, absolutely the right call, um, did it early and then sustained it over a period of time. And if you look at pandemics in the past, that's really key is if you can, if you can uh, institute some of those, uh, some of those, uh, some of those things early on, but sustain them over time, it, it doesn't work if you just release it after two weeks. And those are really important. Um, as far as like the the healthcare sector goes, though, um, you know there were, uh, and I'm talking sort of globally now. Some of the issues that were a challenge were, of course, testing, and I don't think anybody's, you know, uh, uh, hasn't heard that. And so there were some stumbling blocks at at both the national and, and at the local level as well about getting uh, testing up and running. Um, Personal protective equipment, of course, is is a close second to that, if not a first, uh, because you, you really do have to protect the the healthcare worker, regardless of if you're doing testing or not. And and I think there was a an underappreciation on the amount of demand that there was going to be on on personal protective equipment. Part of that was um, really human psyche almost, and part of it was failure to plan. Even though we had a, a, a sort of a pandemic cash that SSM personally had, uh, we burned through that extremely quickly. And, and so, uh, so maybe that, that helped me flesh out an idea, but uh, communication is key. Um, and so I think if there's one thing that we could have done more is maybe over communicated um, both for the, the public and for the healthcare sector, because we had challenges even internal to healthcare about uh, 
you know, um, direction on what we should be doing, how should we be approaching things? You know, it's hard to second guess because this was coming at us, uh, you know, a hundred miles an hour and we're making decisions on the fly. And so, but, um, you know, with, with hindsight being 2020, that's, those are some of the things I think we could have done better. Thanks, Alex. Um, I'm going to turn to Enball and Chris uh, to team up on this one because we had a question, Jared, you touched on it with respect to data management. And Jared, I'm, I'll leave the mic open at the end here if you want to talk any more about the challenges there. But, but I want to take the other side of data management because frankly, you could imagine that some parts of our audience and our populace might be a little nervous about what the government has and how it uses it. And what do you mean it, Enbal, I think you used the term anonymized. Well, how, how anonymized is it, you know, exactly, et cetera. So maybe you all can talk to those privacy or maybe cultural barriers that might exist to what Alex, and by the way, I'm putting words in your mouth, Alex might consider to be a really effective, you know, tracing capability that, that would be helpful from a health perspective, but might be a little nerve wracking from a privacy perspective. Enbal, we want to start that? Yeah, thank you. So I think one of the one of the projects that we did earlier on in COVID was uh, mid March we did a nationally representative study that looked at geospatial data and who owns those data. So um, really thinking through about if my if I had a COVID if I had symptoms of COVID if I was um, diagnosed with COVID and who should see those data, and by and large our um, 70% of the respondents said, yes, the government should see these data and they should see other people's data who have infections as well. Um, and I think that that felt really good for me, <laughs> right? So I do research looking at real-time data collection because I think that the technology that we have today really informs our public health and our healthcare needs in ways that we hadn't been able to access, access before. Uh, the challenge with that is um, people's perceptions change over time. You know, back then it wasn't, um, it wasn't perceived a political statement to wear a mask. And so I think that there's likely going to be a shift if we were to conduct the same study now, I wonder if there, we would have different responses. Uh, I think the other flip side is what do we do? You know, so what do we do? What decisions do we make? And how do we, to think back to what Alex said, how do we best communicate um, when we're reopening college campuses, for example? Um, how do we get people to say, yes, I want to I want to use this app and I want to monitor my symptoms and tell you where I'm located and and let you see where I might be exposed to COVID? I think those are push pull um, data privacy challenges we've talked about previously, Robert, but I think this is a, a different slice of it that there's a, a community collective response that I feel like there's a shared responsibility, but I, I think the onus is not equitable. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's a, it's a, such a great question, quite honestly. Uh, but I, I also think that this question of privacy is, is not just the cultural piece, right? This is a, a very American situation, which is the reason why we had trouble getting people to stay home. I mean, people's individual freedoms felt threatened. I mean, that's a cultural thing about American society. And so then we see the pushback now where people started coming out protesting, regardless, even before the protests around George Floyd, there was this, this energy of we're coming out the house regardless, right? We saw this, you know, people had stormed, you know, governors, uh, state houses and things of that nature across the country. So, but there is in, in, term, in terms of people of color, there is a kind of basic common sense about this question because the healthcare systems have historically failed our communities typically. And so the idea that now we're going to go and say, Hey, let's give over all this information. It strikes people as, as antithetical to their fundamental kind of just way in which they have to protect themselves. That's a condition of institutionalized racism that's been embedded in all of our systems from the banking systems to the food delivery systems to the healthcare system. So that's something that we have to deal with. I think it's coming up now, but I think this question of privacy uh, around contact tracing is just people have to uh, make decisions that are gonna be to the benefit of, of the welfare of the communities as a whole, right? And so we're doing things like wearing masks and we're doing things like getting tested 
so that we don't endanger other people. And I think that the more we think in a collective sense uh, as, as people in this society, the better off we, we're gonna be. That's why when I came back from Austin, Texas in early March, they had shut down South by Southwest, which drove somebody, some people crazy. And when I got back to Lambert, everybody was talking about COVID. When I went to the grocery store, I was the only one with gloves on. Two weeks later, everybody was in masks. Everybody was in gloves. And it was like a, a switch that happened so quickly. But I think to Alex's point, the more we do early on is, is the, you know, gonna help us all. But I just think that this fundamental sense of one's individual freedom being impinged upon, you know, actually got us in more trouble than we perhaps should have been in. That's my two cents. And I'm not, I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV. Yeah. Well, thanks, Chris. Well, good. I'm glad you brought up trouble because I'm going to see if I can get Jason in some here. So, Jason, uh, we've talked about city decisions. Uh, Alex mentioned state houses, and obviously the federal government has a role here. You kind of get to at least see some of those discussions that go on between, you know, coordination and even locally city and county or state to state right? Because the river uh, is not that far away and Illinois matters to the St. Louis region. Any, any comment or uh, thoughts you'd have about how that's been going and, and uh, in knowing that we're not done, any improvements therein that if you were, uh, I don't know what the title is to oversee all that king or God or something, but anyway, sitting above all of that fun, Jason. Muted, Jason. Yeah, no, thanks, Robert. It's it's a great question. It's fascinating. And I will tell you, being up uh, uh, close working with our uh, healthcare leaders and public officials, you know, during that, that time period, it actually restores your faith in the public sector to make tough decisions. Because, um, you, you know, the metropolitan area, like a lot of metropolitan areas, is complex and it's it's diverse. There's different levels of population density. There are different political uh, considerations, way that issues are processed. But at the end of the day, of course, the virus doesn't know any of those boundaries. And we are interrelated from a workforce standpoint, um, our families and, and everything. So we're constantly crossing those lines. So it is very difficult for, you know, particularly elected officials that get elected within a certain geography but to ask them to make really tough decisions, leadership decisions that transcend and suspend that boundary way of thinking. It's easy for us to say when we're not put before voters, I'm very sympathetic to that. And what I saw was truly remarkable. Were there tough uh, decisions, tough conversations? Um, absolutely. Uh, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, this region and its elected leaders who ultimately have to make those uh, decisions in partnership and listening to others, um, they rose to the occasion. And the fact that, uh, you know, St. Louis City and County issued their shelter in place orders on the same day um, and, uh, you know, coordinating with their elected officials uh, throughout the region I mean, when you think about the sheer amount of geography that we have to span, and it's easy now that we are in June to look back and say shelter in place was the right decision to hammer the virus down. But at the time that the elected officials made that decision in the metropolitan region of St. Louis, they made it way ahead of most governors in this country. And I always say the true test of leadership and courage is how easy you or how early you can make those tough calls and tough decisions. It's easy to do it after everyone else has. So, you know, to be honest, it sort of restored my faith that we can rise to the occasion. And the conversation that was coming out of that in a lot of other uh, civic discussions I was in was if St. Louis can do, uh, make those kinds of tough calls in the crisis, just think about what this metropolitan uh, region could be if we, we answer some of the other calls to actions, the opportunities and needs of this community with that same level of urgency. We can do it, and that's what it proved. Um, and I just, I'm so excited to see where that can go in the decade ahead, knowing what, what we were able to accomplish uh, as, as a region. 
Thanks, Jason. Um, Alex, I'm going to come back to you with what I think is a quick question that we've gotten in our Q&A. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to have a jump ball for the whole group, um, a much broader question. Uh, the question was about testing uh, capacity, especially in lower income or underprivileged parts of our community. Yeah. Can, you speak, can you speak to any progress there? Yeah, uh, there's been tremendous progress for that. Um, and so early on, uh, I think uh, it's it's not uh, uh, lost on anybody that we had tremendous challenges in doing testing uh, across the board. But uh, early on, the majority of the testing was taking place in in the healthcare uh, facilities, right? Um, so there wasn't a whole lot of testing going on out in the communities. As time went on, as and there's various reasons for that. Some of it is supply chain issues and other things. Uh, but as time went on, we were able to expand that envelope. When I say we, it's the collective we. It's public health, healthcare systems, uh, FQHCs, federally qualified healthcare centers, all of the above. Uh, we're able to sort of catch up with with the supply chain. And so um, and so then uh, the the city, the county were able to expand testing out into um, low income and and uh, other communities. And so right now, really, it's anybody that wants to get tested, whether you're symptomatic or not, uh, can get tested in really just about any place within the city or the county, uh, which leads to other um, interesting dilemmas about looking at how do you look at test data. But uh, but be that as it may. Um, very slow to begin with, but but now it is, I, would, I don't want to say unlimited, but but it's it's uh, it's fairly wide open now. Thanks, Alex. Um, okay, so uh, this question comes from uh, someone who was uh, crediting and thanking Dr. Tinson for his uh, remarks with respect to where the really important work's happening now but also that there still are underserved parts of our communities um, today. And perhaps if, if your job is research or data management or data application, say at Esri um, or research at SLU, um, how can we um, redress the gap? That is to say, how can we get better information? And Chris, you may have mentioned part of the problem is trust. Right? You, you reap what you sow, and if you haven't developed the trust, you may not be able to get much uh, partnership here. But anyone want to try to begin to answer the, those, that question of gaps in our baseline understanding, especially with these underserved communities? I'll, the, I'll have one kind of starting comment here. One of the things we've seen a pattern emerge in a lot, you know, very much recently, but, um, you know, overall is the need when these statistics are being reported at different levels, they need to be broke down, you know, by these race and ethnicity categories to shine some light on, on what's going on and understand, you know, what's happening. I, I had mentioned one of the tools that we had developed early on which, you know, helped organizations determine where to put testing locations, not just based on where people were at, but where people, you know, that are having more difficulty getting access to these things. So, you know, these things are all just, you know, um, little pieces that technology can help with the overlying process. But, you know, I, I suspect that some of the panelists have a, a lot more experience kind of diving into this a little bit deeper. I think I would, I mean, so I think I'd want to, couple the idea that there's tons of data available in ways that we didn't traditionally have this much in public health and healthcare before. And so I think we need to recreate what we consider data in those, those silos and say, these are informing the challenges that we have, understanding the barriers and the, um, and the, the protective pieces of our community so we can better understand and better identify where and how to do some of the work that we need to do. I think um, our underserved populations have been underserved for a really long time. This is just accelerated. Our COVID response is, um, it, the COVID in general has shown us this is what happens when we don't, when we don't fix these problems that we've known that exist. And so uh, I think we're, I'm, I'm hoping Jason's right. I'm excited about about opportunities to say, this is how we can do it differently. This is how we can create equitable employment opportunities that put, when, when you're put at risk, these are some safeguards that we can, we can implement that say, this is not going to make you take several hourly wage jobs, or this is what a paid leave looks like. This is what happens when you're sick 
for your family. This is how we do better for our community members and for the jobs that they take. Yeah, yeah. and the one thing that I would add on there is it's a, it's a matter of scale. You know, I mean, I, I, I've been in health GIS for a long time and people always want to report things at the county level and a lot of the details get lost you know, unless you go down to the community level and a lot of things get obscured when you average things out across large geographies. And um, so it, it's really important, you know, to, you know, dig in and understand the different geographies and the interplays between those geographies. And you know, I, I just keep coming back to, you know, um, Dr. Tinson's um, kind of, uh, what, what was it, the geographies of exclusion? I think it's extremely important. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you know, this is that moment. Everything has been going fine in this in this conversation, and and now I'm about to break the internet. Okay, so the question is, how how can we invest, but but almost over invest? This kind, you know, just over invest in where we know the gaps exist, where we know that there's been chronic ailment, chronic suffering. Is there a way in which we can overcommit ourselves? I don't think that we, as a society, not just in St. Louis, but as a society, have we over-invested? And I'm just using that term, even though it might not, you understand the gist of what I'm trying to say. Take it, take what we think is, is needed and double down and continue to do that. And, and for me, that's a reparative justice framework more than it is a charity framework. And I think that that is going to be critical to how we not just reframe and understand and educate ourselves, but really how we move into some structural transformation of these systems. And even if we do a piece at a time, at least we are working with a conservative effort that this is towards transformation and rather than band-aids. Because I think the next pandemic is going to have the same kinds of data sets attended to it, unless we are very intentional and allocate resources to redirecting that. Okay, we're now officially warmed up. Thanks, Chris, uh, for that. Um, okay, uh, since since we, we've got that uh, uh, conversation going, let me see if I can open another uh, really difficult one. Chris talked about homeschooling, right, and the challenges therein, uh, both you know in the house, but also balancing that with work that may pull you out of the house. We got a couple of questions um, in the in the, from the uh, audience about school reopening. And Alex, you're, you're, you're authorized to take a pass if you'd like, but we, can you share some thinking about how we should think about the reopening of schools in the fall? Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting uh, question, Robert. And I was, I was uh, looking at the, uh, the Q&A box there, and I think I know who put the question in there. So I'll talk with them later. But uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, so you know, uh, so there's there's competing thoughts here, right? Um, so clearly, if you've been in your kid's school and I've been there for parent-teacher conferences, they're pretty cramped, right? And so there is no way that you could practice social distancing, at least in the in the school rooms that my kids are in. Um, kids are naturally social creatures as well, so they like to congregate, um, you know, be in close quarters, and and they're rather noisy too, so they talk a lot. Um, so uh, so there, there's that aspect of not being able to, to do all of those things to reduce transmission. Um, with social distancing, are you gonna have them wear masks, things like that. Uh, so the other piece though is, and there's uh, research that has just recently came out this week that, that said uh, younger individuals are at low risk of, of, of having you know active disease and, and acquiring disease, and they're at very low risk for morbidity and mortality. And so, um, and so you, you have that competing interest as well as well. Maybe this isn't such uh, a, 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 a bad thing to send kids back to school. So I think what it's going to take is we're going to have to see where are we in the disease as the summer comes along. By that, I mean uh, prevalence in the community, right? And so if, if we're developing more immunity in the community, yes, that rhymes. Uh, but but uh, then we'll feel differently about it. If we can get uh, testing up and running and have some really good protocols in place for screening, distancing, how is all, uh, cleaning, all of these things, I think there is potential for a school to be open in the fall. And, you know, Lord knows my wife would appreciate that as well. Um, and so I, I think if we think about this um, and get some good procedures in place, 
coupled with the low risk uh, to, to, um, to, to children, I think it's certainly possible. Well done, Alex. Thanks. Um, really, really weighty, complicated decision. Uh, we've just got a few minutes left for the panel. So what I thought I might do is go to each of you uh, and just fair warning, we'll go in the reverse order of introduction. So Jared, I'll start with you and, and, and we'll finish with Alex. And, and I'll somewhat resummarize the question I gave to Jason. You know, we, we, we've all had our own experiences here, both personal and professional. Uh, we all are many, well, I'll just say this, this participant in this crisis uh, feels strongly that there are more unknowns than knowns at this point. So trying to predict what or when is, uh, is, is, I don't think, the most effective use of our time. But each of us, I think, has, has had a lesson um, that's come through. And, and, um, and again, not to lead the witnesses, it doesn't have to be a decision data driven uh, lesson. Uh, Chris, I think you've talked about some of the lessons that are more emotional or cultural or uh, historic even um, that you'd like to share with the audience as we, as we close out our panel. Um, Jared, you get sure. to go. Sure. sure. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the thing that, you know, that's been reinforced for me, you know, if this has been something I've learned throughout my entire career in public health is, um, you know, data is key and, and you know, over communicate, you know, explain why things are being done. Um, you know, people are heads down. I mean, just because you think somebody got some message or, or, or saw something, they may not. You know, people are, were very busy during this whole incident. And, um, you, know, you know, what I've learned is developing, like, the, the hub that we stood up where everybody could go that was responding to this and look at this hub and find the data they need, find examples about how their peers had been responding, see what different um, healthcare systems were doing and, um, you know, being able to emulate those tools and be able to communicate both, you know, with the public and the constituency, but with the other stakeholder organizations to work in tandem across these groups to solve these problems. I mean, I've just seen data is key and, and you know, location is that one piece of data that's common that kind of helps tie these things together. Thanks, Jared, I appreciate that. Uh, Chris. Takeaway. Yeah, I, I, I've learned a lot just in this short hour that we've been together, so I appreciate you all, and I'm definitely going to be looking up your work around the city and around the country um, and continue to do this work uh, in, in lockstep with what we need. I think, I mean, I think the reason uh, I'm emotional is precisely because of how dire situation is for certain communities. And so for me, I, I'm going to stay fired up about this issue and all of its tentacles and all of the thing that it, that it magnetizes because it's important to see these things as interrelated. We have society that have things in silos and, and things are disconnected. So we talk about food insecurity without talking about uh, predatory housing uh, policy and things of that nature. Or we'll talk about prison industrial complex without talking about education, K through 12 education. So for me, I, I like to think of these things as connected I think I, I want to encourage our public to think more collectively and connectedly about these issues and to see how they relate. But they are rooted in history. I'm a historian, so I go there first. But I think that these are issues that if we're smart and intelligent and fired up, then we can actually make some, some headway on this in a, in a very intelligent way. It might not be as, as swift as we need it to be, but nonetheless, we can work on transforming the society. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. I, uh, I hope you're right. Uh, Jason. Yeah, I, I appreciate it, Robert. Obviously, I uh, shared my views on the, uh, the question about, you know, why I'm hopeful and, and how I think we acted as a region. We decided to create formal structure known as the Pandemic Task Force, which is like an intermediary uh, to help and recruited uh, Dr. Garza as our general. And we were very lucky to have someone who uh, I thought was particularly insightful on medical science, racial equity, and knows both the public and private sectors. I mean, we were lucky in this, we were blessed uh, really to have uh, Dr. Alex Garza there uh, to, to lead this effort. Um, going forward as well, um, I, I saw one of the panelists ask a question about geo futures. And you know, we've talked a lot about geospatial technology being critical to how we get to the underlying and solving some of the underlying health inequities. Um, and 
next week, this, this region is going to roll out um, its roadmap uh, of how we are going to strengthen our role as a global leader in location and geospatial uh, technology. Um, what you will see that is different about that, not only are we as St. Louis going to express our ambitions for how we will be dominant leaders in innovation and apply geospatial technology, but it starts to get at the heart of some of the issues we've talked about on this panel, which is how do you do so in a way that promotes racial equity? And you're going to see in that a lot of intention so that we can start to spread the benefits of the growth and prosperity that we seek to create to more St. Louisans and specifically um, to African Americans in St. Louis. And I think that starts to get at the economic strength and empowerment issues uh, that will help us be more resilient as a community and be a more just society. And I think geospatial technology because of the level of intention that this community, uh, including people on this panel, folks that are, are listening, and Bobby Linkowski I saw in there, that have worked so hard to work through the issues of how you both grow an economy, but do so in an equitable way. And I think St. Louis is at the tip of the spear in the country, and GeoFutures is going to be front and center, and Geospatial will be front and center on how we do that. Because um, if you can get to some of the underlying inequities economically, you start to solve for some of those challenges and the health disparities that are symptomatic uh, of those economic inequities. Thanks, Jason. Um, glad to have you here. Glad to have you in this, in this broader mix. Uh, thanks. Enbol, some parting th thoughts about the way forward. I'm just glad I'm not going last. Um, okay, this is tough enough. I had a plan and it just got thrown away. So. I think of I think of everything has a location lens, and I think everything has an impact on health. That's just the way I think. And so, in the work around COVID, I think the work that we are challenged to do is urgent and collective. And uh, the more conversations we have, we develop a better action plan. And so, I think that. I'm committed to, I already told Chris, we're going to figure this out. We're going to figure ways to work better together in our, in across our silos um, to better inform the work and research and practice that we can implement going forward. I think um, the little bit that I can do in that space is, is my responsibility. Awesome. Thanks, Enbo. Alex, we'll leave it to you to close off the panel's comments. Oh, it's a lot of pressure there, Robert. <laughs> so first of all, I'll, I'll pay Jason off later on for all the nice words oh, wow. he said about me. So, <laughs> so thank you for that. So a couple of things. Uh, one is is sort of on the on the tactical level, and that is um, the geospatial data uh, really I think helped us get a better picture of what was going on out in the community. Aside from you know a lot of the descriptive statistics that we generate about the pandemic, so we can we can always understand like how many infections we have or how many hospitalizations we have, but it's a different thing to understand uh, what communities are impacted more, uh, what are those things that we hadn't thought of, such as population density, travel history, job history, all of those things that really make a complete picture of who is affected by the pandemic. So, and that helps you make very tactical decisions on how you're going to approach things going forward. Um, but, but it also helps you with strategic decision-making, which is, how do we then prevent this from happening in the future? And I think that goes a lot to what Chris was talking about. And as some of you know, I did work in the Obama administration and he had this really great saying about disasters, which was disasters have a way of pulling back the curtain and showing the festering problems that have always been there. And so I think it is incumbent upon us to, to work on the festering problems and that is what is going to fix um, uh, or what's going to help be resilient in the next disaster. Thanks, Robert. Well, thanks, Alex. Well done. Um, I had the title of moderator for this panel, and uh, it was a privilege to to try my best to moderate such uh, such expert and uh, committed uh, voices and and, uh, and centers of influence and effect in the community. So, thanks to each of you. Um, now that I'm done with that part, I'll offer uh, a two cents point of view. Look, you know. It's, I, at times, uh, we have called uh, COVID, you know, the, uh, or it's been called the invisible enemy. 
And I think that's wrong on both counts. Uh, it's, it's a virus uh, and it's invisible only if we choose to, to make it so. Um, and, and I don't just mean, you know, testing and finding out who has it, but, but being aware of who's vulnerable within our community, what access they have to health care uh, or food security, as was noted. And, and you're right, uh, this has exposed some broad disparities that, that, that pre-existed and they didn't start last year. Uh, they didn't start last decade, they started centuries ago. And so we have got our work ahead of us. Uh, I'm just so glad to have teammates like who are on the screen now uh, to lock arms and, and, and make the kind of double down investments that, that Chris uh, described. Uh, it's been a joy, it's been a privilege. Thanks very much for joining. Thanks for the patience of the people that have joined online. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but hopefully we at least uh, push the conversation forward. Speaking of that, there'll be a second session of this series. It will be about water access during a pandemic and it'll happen next month, so July 2020. A date will be announced um, amongst other platforms via Twitter at SLU underscore research. So again, thanks to everyone who made today possible, to the panelists for joining, for the audience who participated uh, both by watching and contributing. And to each uh, onward, uh, let's move the ball forward and do better. Take care of one another, take care of yourselves, um, and thanks very much for joining us today. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.